Hello, everybody. Welcome in to the NBA Front Office Show. I'm Trevor Lane. You can find me on Twitter at Trevor underscore Lane. Joined by Keith Smith at Keith Smith NBA. Keith, we've got a few topics to get into today, and then we're going to take a look at cap space. Take a peek at the at the future and see what teams are going to have room to make some big moves this coming summer. Um, you have a good Valentine's Day yesterday coming off of uh, off of what was, I don't know, a big day for, for a lot of people, right? <laughs> yeah, I mean, it was pretty quiet for us. We, we yeah. just kind of did our thing, and then we uh, we uh, got into it, and then it was a work night. Celtics played the Bucs. Well, the That's right. Celtics played the Bucs. The uh, Celtics backups played Milwaukee and almost won in, in Milwaukee, uh, to, took it all the way to overtime, and uh, for pretty incredible uh, effort from a bunch of guys who are uh, a little bit further down on the depth chart for the most part. So, uh, you know, it was a very fun game um, to, to cover despite a loss. It was a you know, real scrappy effort. So got a lot of fun. Yeah, with I, that one. I saw a lot of Bucks fans on my timeline that were supremely annoyed at what they were, <laughs> what they were witnessing, which is, which is a good sign if you're a Celtics fan, because that means that your guys are overachieving and doing, you know, what you would hope they would, they would do go out there and uh, wreak some havoc, create some problems for for the Milwaukee Bucks. Um, I kind of had the same. I, I wound up. I it was Valentine's Day, and I spent the evening for three straight hours talking Lakers basketball on various platforms, um, which was crazy. From radio to AMP to the YouTube channel and podcast feed and all, all kinds of stuff. So uh, that was how I spent my Valentine's Day. So <laughs> I guess I mean, not not super romantic, but uh, whatever. You sure, know, sure. Hey, we get to talk hoops. I am extremely lucky. So Valentine's Day always falls during the season. Yeah. Our wedding anniversary regularly falls on opening night or one of the nights around Ooh. opening night. And my wife's birthday is every so often on the NBA draft. <laughs> so <laughs> it's uh yeah, I'm I'm pretty fortunate that I'm still married. So it's uh, <laughs> you know, cuz those all turn into work nights and then we turn those into a uh, we celebrate other days. But yeah, it's a uh, it's a uh, very very lucky. Um, that, very that very forgiving. And then fun. and then we typically get 4th of July and Christmas interrupted yes. <laughs> by NBA yep. games and the NBA free, free agency, agency period. Yep. yep. Yeah, good times. Oh boy, so. this life. Hey, if anybody wants to hang out, Labor Day is pretty cool. For yeah, usually right. free. <laughs> that's, that's, that's what I was already looking ahead to August. I'm like, maybe we can do something in August. Oh, wait, kids right. back in school then. Um, we'll figure it out. <laughs> but anyway, uh, let's let's start with uh, the Dallas Mavericks today. Luca is uh, apparently nowhere close to leaving the Mavs. Now, that was uh, it's been a talking point like, hey, if the Mavs don't do something, they don't get that second star finally. Is Luca going to be on his way out the door? How soon are we going to start hearing about Luca maybe looking elsewhere? Uh, reportedly that's not going to be anytime soon, which is great for the Mavs, especially after they just traded for Kyrie Irving, cashed in a lot of chips to go get him. Uh, Luca sounds like he's going to stay put for a bit. Yeah. And this is one of those things where instantly, right. Speculation goes to is Kyrie enough. Uh, is Kyrie going to be the one that does Luca get upset and does that force Luca out of there? What, what does that look like? I still think the Nets did a good job to take a draft pick that could potentially be in the post Luca uh, years. Cause that's just smart business by, by the Nets. But yeah, I, I mean, I think Luca is knows enough that he's under a long-term contract and, if it's not working in a few years, then he can say something. But for now, just kind of play it out and see how it goes. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. And then on top of that, we got news that Kyrie is most likely going to stay in Dallas as well. Now, I this is almost kind of funny, though, because it's Kyrie. I mean, how how certain can we feel about what he about right now? Here we are in February about what decision he's going to make in July. I mean, I listened to him tell a entire building full of fans and Celtics teammates and front office and coaches and everybody, Hey, I'll resign here this summer. And by the time summer rolled around, he was long gone. <laughs> he was out the door to, to Brooklyn. So I'm not a, uh, I, I sure. Okay, great. That that's fine. We'll, we'll say this for now and then we'll see. And I kind of respect Kyrie's uh, thing he asked the media like hey i don't want to be asked about this every time yeah. i talk to you guys like let's i think it was he's trying to turn it into a disrespect thing but i, I think he also understands like i get it right you're just going to keep asking anyway but now he said he's not going to answer those questions and he can very i have no problem then if he says next question you know move on and go and, yeah. and what we'll see is then maybe you know 
playoff series comes around there end of regular season let's see what it looks like then he can probably um you know be expect to get those questions and maybe have to provide a little more clarity the reality is dallas can pay him more than anybody else can uh it's a we're going to talk about it a little later there's no immediate suitors that jump out for Kyrie um in this free agent market so um so we'll see what, what it looks like but i guess yeah, this probably makes sense that this is where it's going. And if you're Dallas, you traded for him with the idea of we're giving up real value <clears throat> with the idea of we're going to resign you and have you here long term. Yeah, I think really that's a there's a couple of things here, right? So first and foremost, if you're Dallas, like, yeah, you can't really just assume that it's a done deal that he's staying or anything like that, just based off of kind of the general feeling right now, because part of it is it's Kyrie. Part of it is that's you know NBA free agency and the way it goes sometimes. But this is much better than the alternative, than word getting out that, hey, Kyrie's going to really explore the market or Kyrie's already got his eyes somewhere else, right? Like that's that would be much yes. worse than, hey, Kyrie's most likely going to resign. And again, you can't take that as, oh, it's a done deal because it's not. And because it's Kyrie, that's an even bigger factor. But nonetheless, this is this is the best thing you could hope to hear. And then Kyrie's approach, I don't mind that either because there's no right answer. There's no way to answer that question. Like if he says... I am staying in Dallas. I'm committing to this team. Now, maybe he can put a qualifier on it and say, as long as the money makes sense or something. But otherwise, if he says right now, and he's been there for what, like a week? And he says, this is it. I want to put down roots here and stay in Dallas forever. And then the Mavs come along and they say, well, two-year deal, second year, non-guaranteed. That's the best we're going to do for you. Then suddenly he's the bad guy for yep. looking to go somewhere else, right? Like he's not looking out for his own interest on the flip side if he says well i don't know you know we'll see how free agency plays out i'm gonna i'm gonna have my options in front of me and all that which he's not wrong but that's gonna make people upset in in dallas because you don't want to give up a bunch of stuff for a guy who's gonna leave in the summer so he, it's it's a no-win situation and so shutting down the question as much as he can is probably the the right path yeah i i have no problem with this and i have no problem now if he's asked after, I think they're playing tonight after tonight's game, and he says no comment or next question, he already told you he's not talking about that. So, you know, it's probably best to, to leave it alone and then approach it later, you know, when the season is closer to being wrapped up and finished, and you can kind of have that, that discussion. Then I don't know that you're going to get any more of a real answer at that point, but, you know, you, you can definitely go there, go, go there then. So let's go ahead – Let's uh, let's go back to the future too here. Let's hop in the DeLorean, get it up to 88 miles per hour, and let's move forward in time and take a peek at cap space projection. I had to get in, uh, you know, some some 80s references here. <laughs> I love it. Um, cap space projection. So who is going to have room this summer? You mentioned there's not going to be a lot of suitors for Kyrie. Now James Harden, also a name that could be out there. Maybe he goes back to Houston. Mm -hmm. we'll, we'll see. But let's uh, let's take a look. Keith, what do you have in terms of your cap space projections? Who's going to have room to do some interesting stuff this summer? Yeah, for those who would like to read the article and the more in-depth thoughts on each team, uh, I did cover all 30 teams and where it looks like they're probably lining up uh, to be this summer. But uh, you can find that over at spottrack.com. You can also find it on my Twitter timeline. Uh, you can get in there and, and find all those things. But eight teams right now I project to have cap space, so just eight. Uh, Houston Rockets lead the way, 56.2 million. Let me go back, actually, and uh, say, too, when I do these cap space projections, I project options being picked up or declined. I project uh, what happens with guarantees and non-guaranteed contracts. Um, I use the 538 uh, predicted standings for the remainder of the season to the end of the season for the draft pick uh, cap hold. So I can plug those in, which pick each team will have. And then that's how I go through this uh, with this. So these are uh, before anybody says, yeah, but does this include X? Right. Yes, it's factored in, whether it's a cap hold or a factor of the player being renounced or whatever it is, I factor all those things in. So, Wait, and that's, I think that's important to note because there's, you know, fans of a team might, we might hit summertime and they go, wait, wait a second. Keith said we were going to have 26 million in cap space. How do we only have 14? Well, a guy that was projected to, to not pick up his option, picked up his option, right? Surprisingly, yeah. right. It, it shocked us. So that's the best we can do right now is just kind of make that prediction in terms of what a player is going to do, but that's not always exactly the way it goes down. So I think you know, th these numbers are not set in stone. There are some decisions that still have to be made that can affect these. 
Yeah, that's a great call. And I continue to tweak these as we get more information, as we get closer to those option decision dates. It's, you know, sometimes we find out, all right, this player is going to opt in or this guy's going to opt out. And I generally, you know, I'll let you know, wow, that's different than what I thought. And here's how it changes the cap space uh, projection for these teams. So, all right. So going back, cap space teams, eight teams, Houston Rockets lead the way, 56.2 million. Now, here's what's important, I think, to know with these is, that sounds great, right? But what does that mean? Well, 56 million, the max tiers for new contracts next season off of 134 million cap project to be 33.5 million. That's the guy's zero to six years of experience. Essentially, those are your guys coming off their rookie deals. Mini 40 max. point. What's that? Uh, the, the mini max. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Then 40.2 million. That's kind of your, your medium max there, if you will. Um, those are your guys that that's your mid mid uh, career veteran guys, seven to nine years of service. Then 46.9 million. Those are your players that are coming off of their, uh, you know, that they've got 10 plus years of experience. That is the so-called super max for those guys. So, Going back to that projection for the Rockets, 56.2 million. So let's say they do get James Harden. Well, there goes all but about nine and a half million dollars of your cap space, right? You're, you're giving it all to James Harden and off we go and we'll figure out the, the rest of it as we go forward with this. So obviously it's not quite that simple and very oversimplifying, but that just, I think, helps ground people in. Okay, 56 million sounds awesome. Can we sign three max guys? No, that's one max guy with some leftover. Uh, for the Utah Jazz, uh, 53.8 million. This is an updated, uh, majorly updated projection after they made their, their moves at the trade deadline to move Mike Conley along, move Malik Beasley along, uh, move Jared Vanderbilt along. I, I had previously projected them down somewhere in the high 30s to low 40s. So I've mm -hmm. bumped them up. San Antonio Spurs, 46 million. Spurs took on some money into next year for both Devontae Graham and Kem Birch, so their projection comes down just a little bit. Oklahoma City Thunder, $30.4 million, enough to really be a player to add a major guy into what is a young team. Now, for them, what's a little bit different is they've got a mostly full roster, too, so you could spend that $30 million on one player or two players if you're really like, this is a guy that's going to put us over the top and push us in. The Detroit Pistons, 27.9 million. A lot of people ask questions when the article posts, like, what happened? I thought Detroit was going to be up in the 50 million range. Well, they kept Bogdanovich, they kept Burks, and they brought on James Wiseman. So all that put together, that that took away you know, roughly $30 million in cap space because I don't think they kept Burks just to simply renounce him uh, this summer. So, um, so I'm projecting he sticks around. Indiana Pacers, 26.6 million. Since the last time I did one of these projections, that's changed. Biggest change there. Miles Turner did the renegotiation and extension. They were going to be up in the high 40s, maybe low 50s, but 20 plus million on the books for next season for him. Then you get down to the last couple of teams. Sacramento, very much a swing team, 21.5 million. A lot of this depends on what happens with Harrison Barnes and his cap hold. If I think he's going to get significantly less than what he makes this year. So then what you can do then is you could renounce him, resign him with part of your cap space and have a little bit left over again, much like the thunder, pretty full roster. So that, that uh, 20 million can go pretty far, even if you use some of it to resign Barnes, then the Orlando magic last team, 21.1 million, um, the biggest change in the projection here is they didn't trade Gary Harris at the trade deadline. I think they're probably going to hang on to him. They'll guarantee him at 13 and a half million and they'll move forward with that. So that's, that, that's where we're at. Just those eight teams and only a few of them have enough to really get in the max race for players. So for that, it gives you a little bit better of a sense of who the cap space teams are going into the summertime and how much they'll have to spend. And these probably won't change too much. Maybe the next big opportunity to change these will be around the draft, which is really the start of the offseason anyway. So looking at these teams, I mean, th these are all teams that are at the or at or near the bottom of their conference, with the exception of the Sacramento Kings. Mm -hmm. uh, what which of these teams do you think could really shake things up on the market or in position to to do something like that? I mean, obviously, they're not. Most of these squads are not landing spots for a Kyrie, for a James Harden, maybe with the exception of, of Houston in the case of Harden, since we've heard that link there before. But mm -hmm. but there's lots of other things you can do besides just free agency 
it with cap space in terms of facilitating trades, taking on players, all, all that sort of stuff. Which team do you expect to be like the most aggressive with, with this space? It might be Oklahoma City. I, yeah. I think there's a chance. They're close, right? They've played really well this year. Um, they, they, Unlike the Jazz, who were in a weird spot, they were playing well, but with some older players, OKC has so many young guys playing for them that they project to also get better, just internal improvement. And again, mostly full roster. So 30 million becomes rather than, hey, we've got 30 million to, to, that we got to spend to fill six or seven roster spots. They could use that 30 million and go and get themselves one really good player and bring somebody in who's a major rotation upgrade for them, really step in and fit with their young core and go forward. No, I don't know who that is. I have no idea. Yeah. Um, but it's also to Trevor's point doesn't have to be a free agent, right? If a, if a mid-career star says, you know what, I want to move. If a Donovan Mitchell type player is like, yeah, it's time, it's time to go. Or he, the team that has a Donovan Mitchell type guy says, yeah, it's time to go. Team like Oklahoma City makes sense where it's time to kind of probably start on the upswing for them uh, with, with that team. So that's, that's what you're kind of keeping an eye on there is who's going to be the next guy to shake loose. And you just want to be in position, right? Whether it's free agency trade or whatever, having that much salary flexibility really can make a major difference for them. Yeah. I think uh, Utah is also a team to keep an eye on. Not that, not that I expect them to just start burning through assets to try to win right now or anything like that, but you've got an all-star already in, in Larry Markkinen. Uh, you've got some interesting pieces there. Of course, they're you know they're not going to be too concerned with their their final record at the end of this season, but they've got so many draft picks at this point because they've traded away so many of their players. They've got so many picks to play with that could make them interesting. Uh, kind of like the way OKC is in terms of getting some big things done that can ultimately mm -hmm. help them out long-term. So those are, for me, I think those are the top of my list. It's it's Utah and OKC. Now, obviously, if Houston goes and lands James Harden, then, okay, that's that's something to, to talk about there. But sure. otherwise, I think those, those two are going to be the big movers and shakers out there on the market. I guess, you know, now that Houston's, you know, the Nets picks might be looking a little bit better, so maybe Houston's got a little more to play with there. But if a team really wanted to go out there and be – a major buyer. I'm looking at Utah and, and OKC as the teams with the most capability to do that. Yeah, because I think to your point is none of the other teams seem quite ready yet. San Antonio, Detroit, probably not. Detroit, maybe they could be kind yeah. of interesting where they kept Bogdanovich, they kept Burks. Orlando, I think, is you know, maybe a one player away from really being something in the east but you know again they may look at it and say, Oh, we've got years of projection to go on this. Let's do eternal improvement let's continue to move forward that way the other thing that could change things for these teams is victor Wembanyama, because there could be there's two schools of thought either you get him and let's go for it right now let's try to be good day one with him and let's go or the other option is hey we got him we just bought ourselves the next four years of we just got to figure it out around him so it'll be interesting to see who lands that number one overall pick and gets one Banyama because that's going to probably change how some of these teams treat their off season. And one team that's obviously not in that group there of the group that we shared is the Charlotte Hornets because they're sitting in the next group. And in that next group, these are the teams, six teams that I project have the non taxpayer mid level uh, this summer, Charlotte, right at the top of the list. Now Charlotte's in a weird spot here because they could be a cap space team. A lot for them depends on what happens with PJ Washington and Miles Bridges. Um, if they they were to resign only one, they could probably still have cap space. If they resign both, probably not. The Bridges situation, obviously, it seems like they kind of floated a trial balloon uh, just before Christmas of hey, we're thinking about resigning Miles Bridges just to see what the reaction was, and then it never went anywhere good. But that situation one way or another is going to resolve itself this summer, um, whether he's back with them on a new contract or he's not. So we'll see what that looks like. So they're a swing team in this much like Sacramento is a swing team. Um, Memphis should have the full taxpayer mid-level. Their, their team is a, a really full roster. And if they re-sign Dylan Book, Brooks, they may have a completely full roster. We'll see what that looks like, but they could use the full mid-level Chicago, a lot of it depends on what happens with Vucevic, whether they're a mid-level team. If Vucevic just walked and they were to move on from DeRozan or Levine, they could potentially be a cap space team. We'll see what that looks like. 
Minnesota should have the full non-tax burden. This is important for them too to use it right now because this is probably the last year they're going to have it because next summer, the summer of 2024, they're going to have Carl Anthony Towns on the Supermax and Anthony Edwards will likely be on the first year of a max deal uh, with them. And you have Gobert making 30 plus million dollars as well. So a little bit of a tricky spot for the Wolves. And then the Knicks and the Blazers kind of rounded out as your kind of mid-tier teams that are pretty good to have their, their books more or less in order. We'll see what happens with Portland. If Portland gets crazy with re-signing Jeremy Grant and mm-hmm. a couple other guys, then they'll probably be a tax team. And then they'll, they'll probably dip out. But the Knicks should be in position uh, with that. Thoughts on any of those teams? Yeah, I think there there's some interesting ones here. You know, as non-taxpayer teams that could get in. And obviously, that's, there's some flexibility there in that, depending on what they do. But I look at... So when we're talking about the the full mid-level exception and you look at the purchasing power that that has, I think that's where the location starts to become an even bigger factor. When you've got multiple teams that can pay the same amount of money yep. and you're chasing after what is not a max level player, right? If it's if it's James Harden and he suddenly tells a team that, hey, I want to go to your team, they're going to move players in order to try to free mm-hmm. up the, the money to do that. Um, yep. The same isn't true of the mid-level guys. So that's where... You get there's there's guys that will get the mid level and guys that are bargains on the mid level, and I look at a team like Memphis, and I think they could be a team that could get a guy where they're probably worth more than a mid level, but because of where Memphis has been, where they're at, where they've been at in the standings, because a guy could come in and I don't have a player in mind right now, but a guy could come in and say, hey, this is a team that's one piece away, and I can be that that piece for this team. I think Memphis could be a team that could really make uh, make use of a full mid level and grab somebody where you go, whoa, okay, that's that's a pretty good deal, and uh, and get an impact player there. Whereas, you know, if it's the Knicks or somebody, or or say the Bulls, you're probably not getting a guy to take a discount necessarily to go there. Yeah, it's important to note too, cap space dries up very very quickly. We just went mm-hmm. through it, right? That's one max signing takes all of those teams out of the cap space, (laughs) you know, they're they're out, right. They're completely out of cap space, all of those teams. And then what happens is now all of a sudden you have a whole bunch of players standing around that are like, Whoa, wait, like I thought I was a $25 million player. Now all of a sudden it seems like, Hey, I have the the 11, $12 million mid-level to offer you. What do you think? And it's all right. Well, Memphis is pretty good and I'll sign and Maybe they do shorter, like maybe only do a year on the mid-level because I'll get back on the market a year from now. And that's, that's where that'll go. So yeah, it, it's one of those things where as long as you use the mid-level smartly, you can really pick off some good value signings. You just maybe, they may not all be, you know, the four year mid-level deal where it's sure. like, wow, this was you know a great, great addition, you know, for that. We move into the next teams. These are non-taxpayer or taxpayer mid-level teams. The reason why I split this up is otherwise we're going to have a group of over half the league as taxpayers. But yeah. these teams are all in interesting spots, and a lot of it depends on what happens with them. So the Brooklyn Nets, we'll see, right? They're right now they'd be a taxpayer mid-level team. But there's a sense of there's more to come with, with the Nets. They're probably going to yeah. move some guys around. They're probably going to move off a couple more salaries and go. The Cavs? This is solely dependent on what happens like with Karis LeVert and Kevin Love. They sign for team-friendly type of contracts. Cleveland should have the full non-taxpayer, which kind of in the Memphis situation becomes really important because then you can really go get yourself a good player. Dallas, it all depends on what comes down to Kyrie. If Kyrie signs for the max, they're a tax team. They'll have the taxpayer mid-level. Your Lakers. Now, we'll spend a little bit more time here because the Lakers can go a whole lot of different yeah. directions with this um so i actually i'm gonna go through the other two then i'll come back to them because there's only two more toronto who knows what they're doing seems like a lot more to come uh for the raptors this summer and then washington a lot of it depends on if you keep both kuzma and porzingis you're probably going to be playing around the tax which means you're a taxpayer mid-level team if if you lose one of them you probably have the full mle and then you go about trying to replace them so right. let's go back to the lakers the lakers sacrificed absolutely none of their long-term flexibility through their draft um, or trade deadline dealings. That's really important to note because if they still wanted to be a team that pushes 30 plus million in cap space, they can be. Now it's going to mean gutting the entirety of the roster that isn't 
Anthony Davis, LeBron James, Max Christie, and probably Austin Reeves on a fairly low uh, cap hold as yeah. a restricted free agent. That's we've been there, right? <laughs> we've been there, done that. Pro- probably we, doesn't make sense to do that. Yeah, exactly. I now think what the Lakers do is they probably operate as an over the cap team with the idea of D'Angelo Russell, probably not a 30 plus million dollar player, right? In reality, part of why he got that deal was the double sign and trade with Kevin Durant to preserve that salary slot for the Warriors, which ultimately got the manager Wiggins, which helped them win another title. The Lakers probably not in that position. They'll probably, even if they keep Russell, that salary probably comes down some. Um, let's see what they do with Malik Beasley. I tend to think now, probably more likely, let's just pick up his team option. Pick yeah. up that team option. We'll flow it into next year and we'll go. Russell also, I should say this too, extension eligible. We'll see if they decide to go that way or not. He can extend for you know, uh, uh, 67 million or so, 67 and a half. I think it actually is um, over two years. That's the max he can get right now. I Again, I tend to think he's probably coming down under 30 million on his next contract. Rui Hachimura, we talked about this in depth when they got him. Part of the get there was you control his restricted rights. If you like what he does for you over this, well, by the time they got him, probably a 30 game sample size right in that range. Um, great. You can resign him move forward with him as part of your core. I think what the Lakers did was they rebuilt their depth for right now. That had to happen, but they've also built their depth for next year's team as at least, if nothing else, a good starting point um, for a team. It now feels like a more complete and full roster with those guys. Where it all goes sideways is if you get silly and you give D'Angelo Russell, $35 million a year. You give Hachimura 20. And then, then all of a sudden it's like, what are we now? Now you're back into a whole bunch of not great contracts. I don't think they're going to do that. I think they're going to be pretty smart about the way they structure this next set of deals. I think they'll probably keep Mo Bamba or there's probably already discussions of, Hey, we're going to waive you, but we're going to re-sign you to a deal that we think fits a little bit better. Maybe using the MLE, um, as part of it, that's how we'll resign you. Or if we're just staying fully over the cap, we'll resign. Because if nothing else, then he's a nice ten million dollar trade chip in a you know trade down the line. So a lot of flexibility for the Lakers. But I think the idea of them being a thirty plus million cap space team, that's probably gone after their trade deadline deals. Yeah, and by by my projections, if what you're if what you're saying is right, if you wind up around the thirty million dollar range for D'Angelo Russell, you do you bring back Austin Reeves, Ray Hachimura, you get up for I don't know twelve something like that. Um, you're not, you're, you're a luxury tax team, which means you, yeah. you are using that taxpayer, but then there's been some buzz about the Lakers potentially wanting to avoid the repeater tax. We're going to find out real quick, whether or not that is something that they're concerned about yeah. based on what they do. If you see them suddenly say, Mo Bamba, we're going to just wait, we're, we're going to just part ways with you. Rui Hachimura, we're not going to bring, again, they gave up assets to get these guys. I'd be surprised if they did it. But if you start to see some moves like that and suddenly they're replacing a guy who should be getting 10 million or something with a veteran minimum and trying to keep costs down, the, you know what's going on. They'd be trying to, to dodge the repeater yeah. tax. Yeah. If instead of re signing Lonnie Walker for seven plus million next year, they just let him walk, um, no pun intended, right. you end up in a spot where uh, that's a weird move, right? Like that starts yeah. to seem a little bit of an odd decision. So that's a great, great point. So we'll see. Now, the important thing to note with the repeater tax is they could start next year as a tax team. You have all year long to get out of it. As long as you're out of it by, by really the trade deadline, because that's kind of your last like window to make meaningful moves. As long as you get out of it by then, you're good, right? You're, you're now right. out of it. You would reset that clock. So that could be another thing. If next year's not really going the way they want it to, and it's like, Gary, you know, we probably should move on from Malik Beasley and his $16 million, then then you you move on and go, you know, in a different direction uh, with, with that. So that's pro- probably... I wouldn't necessarily say if they start the year as a tax team, I would lock in as this is it. They're a tax team. And that's how it'll finish because there are ways to rectify that throughout the course of the season. It's just you're, you're counting on maybe that happening and that's probably not where you want to be. But yeah, I don't, I don't know that with 
at that point, it'll be LeBron with two years left, AD with two years left. You want to be sending the message of, hey, we're going to cheap out on you and cost a really good rotation player yes. here because that's, that's, that's not a great message to send for guys who are coming up. Um, we're Absolutely not going to spend not. a lot of time on these other teams. There's 10 teams, but these are the 10 teams that are all very likely to be tax teams, yep. which means they'll have the tax pyramid level. This is something I want to address, though, real quick, because Celtics fans somehow got confused by this is just because you use the tax pyramid level in a like Danilo Gallinari, I'll use the real example. Boston used the tax pyramid level to sign him this past summer. He's on a two-year deal, so he can be back next summer. There was somehow there got like word of, well, they don't have it to use again because Gallinari is still there. I I ran into that as well. Yeah, well, with the, with yeah, the, like, with the last couple of years. That, yeah, that seems yeah. to be out there. People, I remember dealing with that years ago with with Montrez Harrell. Yeah, uh, people were yeah. saying, oh, they don't have it anymore because Trez picked up his his option, yeah. his mid level option. No, that, 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 that is not how it works. Yeah. Yeah, the memory refreshes every single year. You either have you have one of the three. You either have the full non tax pyramid mid level. It's about eleven and a half million. The MLE that'll be roughly seven million or so uh, this coming season. Um, or you have the room exception if you're a cap space team. You always will have one of those three. Um, yeah. Then the biannual exception is the one that goes away if you use it. So if you use it as for example, this past summer, Philadelphia used their biannual exception to sign Daniel House. They will not have that um, biannual exception this year because you only get it uh, every other year um, if you if you use it. So taxpaying teams, all these teams that I that I project, they'll be either close enough to the tax um, and, or close enough um, to using it. It's a little bit of a misnomer because you really have the taxpayer if you're over the tax apron and not the tax. But generally, if you're over the tax, you're close enough then mm -hmm. that you generally only want to use it because using the full non-taxpayer hard caps you. And that's a whole we can do an education session on that. That's that a different story. Yep. Um, with that. But that, that's a whole other thing. But these are the teams, Atlanta, Boston, Denver, Golden State, Clippers, Heat, Bucks, Pelicans, Sixers, Suns, Sixers. Obviously, depends on what happens with James Harden. If he resigns there, they're deep into the tax. If he doesn't, then we'll see. The Bucks depends on what happens with Chris Middleton. We've heard some buzz that maybe teams could look to pay a lot for Chris Middleton, one of those cap space teams. So if he leaves, then the Bucks are probably going to be in range of using the full non taxpayer. So bought all the rest of them. They they're very 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 likely, barring something extremely unexpected to be um, teams that are well into the tax uh, next season. They're all some of the most expensive teams right now. A couple people may wonder uh, that are watching and listening because I get asked this after the article posted, how is Brooklyn not there anymore? Brooklyn saved like a hundred million dollars yeah. uh, in taxes when they did their, their deadline dealing. So they, they moved out a lot of money for Kevin Durant and Kyrie Irving, especially long-term money. So, so they're, they're, they're now in a position where, their, their books are pretty good. They'll probably be, my guess is, next season completely out of the tax entirely, barring them making some moves that that I just don't foresee at this point. So so hopefully yeah. that gives you a better look and thought of, all right, this is what we might have to spend this summer. This is what it is. We will obviously, in the months and months and months to come, we will do free agent rankings and all sorts of free agency preview stuff. We've, we'll have all that stuff because now we talked about what teams have to spend. We'll eventually in the months to come talk about who they have money to spend it on. But just wanted to get that out there for everybody here is a little bit of a evergreen uh, content go, going into the uh, post trade deadline. Cause I know myself hand up, I'm taking a little bit of time off here over the all-star break because yep. quite frankly, I need it. <laughs> Absolutely. Yep. Me too. Uh, that's uh, we're going to need it, but um yeah, this is important information heading into what's going to be a big summer for the NBA. Obviously, we're not there yet. We have plenty of basketball left to play. We still have the buyout market and all that kind of stuff. But just good to kind of have this in your in your head, some ideas of who's going to be out there and how much money they're going to have to spend uh, because the, this is going to be important stuff as we inch closer to July and the start of free agency. But, uh, Keith, I, I think that wraps everything up for, for today. Um, again, our, we are going to be taking a little bit of time off, so we'll be out for a few days, but we'll be back shortly and uh bringing you more from the nba front office show thanks everybody for joining us make sure you are subscribing to the youtube channel don't forget to go follow us over on apple Podcasts, spotify wherever it is that you listen to podcasts as well till next time see ya and stay safe